grab a drink. This is the man room. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the man room. I'm your host, Marcus Bridges. Thank you for joining us today for yet another episode of the podcast. You can find us everywhere you find your podcasts. Uh, Follow us on Facebook. That's where I've been updating. We haven't had quite the normal, regular tick of episodes lately, so if you're wanting to know when one's coming out, typically that's where you're going to find the update. Also, make sure to watch the video on YouTube. I put like a similar amount of work into that that I do into the rest of the podcast And it doesn't come out nearly as good as the audio, in my opinion, but it's video and you get to see the smiling face of my awesome guests. Who joins me today uh, from Eugene, sitting here live in the man room with me. Welcome musician and comedian James Manning III. Thanks for joining me, dude. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. No problem. No problem. So uh, we'll kick this show off because I noticed you already had a drink of yours and now I got to get after it. Um, I picked out, you said you wanted a, a stout or a porter. And I picked out Coco Cow Chocolate Milk Stout from Sun River Brewing. Uh, what do you think before I take a drink? Because I'm really curious. It uh, it kind of tastes like, um, be like a coffee, like an iced coffee from the from the Dutch Brothers or something like that. So like, is it super sweet? It's sweet, but it's kind of got a little substance to it. Oh God, it's almost like. Yeah, it's kind of like chocolate milky kind of, too, a little bit. I can get that chocolate milk that they're talking about. Yeah, it's that kind of chocolate. uh, It reminds me of one of the drinks from Dutch Brothers. But, uh, well, the nice thing about porters uh, usually is they don't have, like, a real strong aftertaste. You're right, right. They just kind of hit you and they're done. Yeah. So No, it's great. And, uh, you know, I probably could drink more of those than what I really want to admit because, you know, some beers, they get you a little bit, you know, you might – blowed up which i'm sure would happen with this but because it tastes like sugar candy like i can i could sit there and drink it all day you know that's why i can't go to dutch brothers i understand the you know the local thing behind it but i know if i go there i'll get addicted to like a 700 calorie 40 gram of sugar drink and i'll have to have one every day yeah it's uh, 70 bucks too. Yeah, exactly well they just went public did you hear that? Oh no! They they did their initial public offering on the on the New York Stock Exchange just like a couple days ago. Dutch Brothers did. There's st- I checked it today just out of curiosity. Dutch Brothers stock is already trading at like forty four dollars a share. Oh, uh, you know, usually when I get Dutch Brothers, it makes my stomach hurt. <laughs> uh... Is it that bad? I I really don't drink <laughs> coffee, so I mean, I I don't know. I know that. It seems like there's like this battle between Starbucks people and Dutch Brothers people, and they don't like each other, and they don't like each other's shops. Do you notice that? Uh, there is, uh, but it's sort of like a branding thing, I think. Uh, it's like, <sighs> I don't understand. How, how could you uh, pick one side over the other, especially now that uh, Dutch Brothers says gone publicly traded now they're exactly <laughs> right. the same they're, they're the same goddamn company they were different before yeah but, uh you know not anymore now they're the same damn company uh well <laughs> pretty much they will be after uh, starbucks finds out that their stock is being publicly traded <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Well, I, I really enjoy this beer. I'm glad that you picked it. You know, the reason that I asked my guests to pick the drink is because uh, I, I, keep, I get all these unique suggestions. We've had the only one that's been actually like doubled up on has been tequila. And that was when my buddy Dano and I, we drank margaritas, but then Jen J brought in some tequila, but it was a lot like you did today, brought in something very special and very nice and wanted to share it with me. So we drank that straight and it was... Similar to turpentine, uh, which I know (laughs) (laughs) what you brought in today is not. Um, And we're also going to be uh, enjoying a a 12-year Glenfiddich scotch. Just a little bit of that. Just enough to to wet your whistle on this happy hour. Yeah, well, I mean, the man room, I was like, oh, scotch is appropriate. Actually, what do you think of it? I love it, man. I've had this one before. Um, I got a buddy that is a scotch nut and i mean like he had a scotch club for a while where they met once monthly and there was like a dozen guys and each month a different guy brought the bottle of scotch and they would all meet and drink the whole bottle and it was they would keep a list and never try the same thing twice 
And I mean, it was up to like 300 some odd different varieties of scotch that they'd tried. And uh, he's from Washington. So when he came to Oregon, he would buy as much as he could because it's a lot cheaper down here. <laughs> and this is one of the ones that always stood out on his list was like, because I would ask him like, all right, just in, in general, what's like your favorite just off the shelf scotch. And this is one that he would bring up all the time. Um, so, I mean, it's, I, I love it, man. I, my problem is with scotch is it's just like Dutch bros. It's a little spendy after a while, especially in the quantity that I like to drink it in. You know, I was going to say, uh, do you know why it tastes so good? Mm -mm. It's because it's uh, free. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my uh, my stepdad got me this bottle when he came back from California. Uh -huh. And uh, that's why he bought it was I was like, geez, he also bought me a uh, half gallon of brandy. Oh, wow. Because it's so much cheaper there than it is here even. Yeah. 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 So I guess the further south you go, the cheaper booze gets. I hate that that microphone is doing that to you right now. If you need to take some time and, and really adjust it and like screw with it, I'll I'll just mute you here and I'll kind of keep the uh, I'll keep the chat going. You know, um, I, I find it interesting that so many different states are like that. Like how alcohol can vary so greatly from state to state because the same thing goes on in in Hawaii. I've got an uncle that lives in Hawaii, and one of the first things that my family would do. Every time we would go to Hawaii, because it would always be a little bit of an extended trip, we would go to Costco and get, like, groceries so we could make food at the at the room, you know. And my dad would always run over and buy a half gallon of the Kirkland whiskey, which is Crown Royal, essentially. Oh, okay. And he, I'm like, why do you get that here? And he's like, because it's $30 for a half gallon of this. Like, I spend $30 for a bottle or for a fifth at home. And I can get it for a half gallon so I can drink like a king for the whole time we're here for really cheap. And it never made sense to me until I just figured out that it was all just bullshit taxes and legislation and the like. But um, I feel like, or look, Oregon, if we're better than Washington at something, then that can be it. Congratulations. We have cheaper <laughs> weed and cheaper booze down here. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have weird laws in Oregon uh, pertaining to alcohol, like all of our, we have to have a store specifically for alcohol, uh, which is not the case in California. Right. You're just walking in there, and it's like on the shelf. Oh, it's Jack Daniels. All right. Well, you know, but here we have very specific laws. Yeah. And it's really weird. I mean, and it's it's even stranger when you think that they took over the cannabis industry regulation as well because they're, they're just so different, but they didn't know who else to give it to. Right. Right, they're like somebody that's familiar with something similar. Uh, do we have anything similar? People get drunk. Yeah, you take it, <laughs> OLCC. And you know, because you've worked in the cannabis industry here, how um, frustrating, let's just put it that way, frustrating OLCC was because it, like, I, when I was managing a dispensary, this is like weekly, you just get another email like, hey, we changed it again. It's, it used to be like that. It's not like that anymore. We changed it. And it's like, when you're dealing with customers on a daily basis who have learned that they can go into a store and buy something, they automatically develop a little bit of that. The customer is always right mentality. And when you've got a governing body constantly shifting gears on you and you have to go relay that to your entire customer base, it's a fucking nightmare. Those people aren't nice. Like no, nobody's ever looked at a consumer and been like, that's a good guy. <laughs> you know, it's it, they, they, the customers, they walk into your place, they get angry about shit that you can't control. You're just the middleman, you know? Look, I, I have gripes about the OLCC running cannabis in Oregon, if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't make sense. And they even, I heard they changed the label, too. It's now they got that in there. But what it is, is a lot of times they're making these arbitrary laws. They're not based on any science. Right. They're just arbitrary. And that's what makes people angry. And the regulation that goes behind it. Um, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, I'm sure you have. Uh, the Grown Local podcast. Oh, yeah, with Mike McGowan Mike. And, and Billy Wayne Davis. Yeah, yes. so I'm a big fan of that one because they go into it. They go into the laws, like in California, how they got it uh, put on the ballot. And, mm -hmm. You know, safer than alcohol is their thing. I don't know if it's more fun, but... <laughs> No, it's certainly more fun than alcohol. <laughs> I think that it's it really just depends on, it's kind of on an as-used basis. I know some people that have had a really bad time, but you know what? You shouldn't eat that whole cookie. I told you to have half of it. 
you ate the whole thing. It's on you, you know, be a responsible adult, right? That's it. You know, <laughs> don't drink the whole bottle of scotch by yourself. Right. <laughs> Have a friend there so you can both cry. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or 20 of them so that you can finish it without being completely wasted. Right. Uh, you know, but everybody plays their own game in life. You know, it's, uh, you know, we're humans. We do weird stuff like... You know, to have fun, we smoke carcinogenic plants and uh, drink solvent. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's it's really weird. You, th- you it it could have been gasoline. We just got to this first. It, it, that's the only difference. It's not that far from gasoline. <laughs> it's really um, not. You know, some of the old rigs in like the twenties and thirties. I saw this on MythBusters. It's, it's so over my head from a mechanical standpoint. I'm not smart. But on MythBusters, they poured like high grain alcohol into like an old. Uh, I think it was like a flathead V8 engine or something like that, like a really old one. And they were able to crank it up and get it started because they just needed a flame. Like yeah. they just needed something that would combust. And I don't think that it was probably uh, real helpful, but that was how sometimes moonshiners, when they were running like super like rural routes where they weren't going to be by a gas station, they would take a bottle of their moonshine, pour it right into the carburetor just so they could keep going. You know, I mean, it's fascinating what we've done for alcohol (laughs) (laughs) yeah well and that's just kind of how americans and humans are in general but particularly uh, particularly us americans because somebody will be like uh i'm sorry but the way you're making your living is no longer acceptable and we'll be the first ones to be like well fuck you (laughs) you know like (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> that it's funny that because it's like people might hear that and think like, oh, he's doing a regional dialect. You're right in the region that's saying fuck you at that point in time, because that's how everybody sounds like when they tell the government to fuck off. Right. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> well, especially if you're from where I'm from, like I got family down in Texas and Oklahoma. So fuck you <laughs> yeah. is a certain kind of. You know. <laughs> is there, those, those people will shoot back. That's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. What do you do? You spend much time with your relatives that live down there in the in the southwest? Oh well, I have recently. I got to go back, and it was really cool because, like, I traveled at a time like I had just got my vaccine. Uh, there was nobody in the airport. I thought I was going to be late everywhere I went, and the planes were delayed. And I got right through and was there for forty five minutes or something. Um, so I had a great time when I was out there. Um, and you know, my cousin, he's super hospitable, love the guy. I call him all the time and we just go back and forth and he's always so jealous of how much weed we have here in Oregon. (laughs) I was telling him I was making hash with my buddy and he was like, well, it's, you know, that's like 50 bucks a gram down here, man, or something like that. I'm like, (laughs) we give it away over here. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, uh. I know he was amazed. He looked at one of my jars and was like, do you see the bottom of this jar? He was showing his wife. Do you see this? <laughs> he was just like, you know, in the bottom. I'm like, yeah, it's an old jar. You know? <laughs> do you travel with it when you have to fly and stuff like that with, with cannabis? I know that it's it's something that we Oregonians and us people on the West Coast have really, um, I think a lot of people have gambled with because the TSA will tell you in Oregon, we don't screen for cannabis actively if we find it. We'll take it from you, but we don't screen for it. We don't look for it. And every time I go through that metal detector, I'm sitting there thinking about my bag that's on the belt. And I, you know, I'll bring like vape cartridges of oil and I'll throw them in with my, uh, with my wife's makeup so that you can't see. It's like it looks like another little cartridge in there that she might use. But I'm nervous as hell, man. But I, I will admit on this podcast, which might screw it up for me, I do travel with it. <laughs> because A, if you don't have it where I'm going, I'm going to want it. And I don't want to go talk to a guy that I'd have to buy it from on the street. And B, ours is is a lot better than a lot of places that you can go get it. So It's so much better. <laughs> it's, I, I hate uh, to say that because people from out of state, was like, oh, it's weed. What do you think? No, God, it's no. so much better here. Yeah, it's do you so know- much better. That really good bud that was nice and green and crystally, you got that one time back in the day? Yeah, it came from Oregon. <laughs> right. <laughs> it traveled thousands of miles to get to you, and we have it on the bottom shelf next to a bag of, of, of just shake, right? And then you can keep going up from there. It's amazing. So do you do you try or do you not want to say? I, well, no, I, I actually, I'm one of those guys that's super nervous about it too. And really, it's not that important to me. Like, I smoke all the time. Uh, d- don't get me wrong. It's Not, very important. Wouldn't get you wrong at all. I but can't. if I'm going to Texas, it's like, 
Meh. You know, I think it's okay. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm going into the place that they will get you. Right. They're looking for you. They'll because, shoot you for that shit there. It's, <laughs> they will arrest you for a nug next to your foot at a party, <laughs> is what I've heard. Wow. And it's just like, it's not my nug. It's, it's on the ground. You're going yeah. down, son. Yeah. You know, like, they're very stringent about it there. But the strange thing is, is Oklahoma is has recently started their medical programs, and there's, uh, there's things moving in that direction. And being someone who's visited Oklahoma in the past... I did not see that coming. <laughs> They're still real boomer sooner down there, aren't they? <laughs> no, well, but some things never change. Right. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. it's, that's great, though. I mean, I see it. Look, sooner or later, the federal government's going to have to address this. And with the things that are going on in government these days, I would suggest legalizing cannabis as simply optics. Just if you want the country to kind of like you more than what they do now, everybody's approval ratings in the shitter. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you stand on. Come together over weed and and maybe we'll like you a little bit more at this point in time. You know, I mean, let's just because that's the thing is, why should you be nervous to go to Texas with it? It's just a state. It's a chunk of land where we're in. You know, I've had. uh, Do you know who Chris Castles is? Uh, I guess I'm unfamiliar. I'd... So Chris was a former Eugene comedian, moved to Austin about five or six years ago and okay. is doing comedy in Austin now. And he, I mean, he used, I used to buy my weed from him before it was legal. <laughs> like I would go down and see Chris and he's a hilarious stand-up comedian and things are going well for him in Austin on the stand-up circuit, but he got busted for something that he still can't talk about because it's still an active court case where he's facing like close to 10 years in prison for like a, a a trafficking charge that would in Oregon they would be like no that's not tra- they don't consider that tra- because he was in traffic is that why when they caught him that's not trafficking right but <laughs> in Texas it's like a high class felony and he's it's funny because I have him on this podcast and we talk about smoking weed and everything and talk about you know I used to buy from him and now he's like I got to be kind of careful because you know I've got this pending court case and the whole thing it's wild man it shouldn't I mean. Maybe I'm maybe I'm being a little bit too like uh, liberal about this part. Maybe it's maybe there's a reason that it's not okay. I think we've proven in Oregon and especially along the West Coast, Washington, even Colorado, uh, that people aren't running naked through the streets. Nobody's losing their mind at this point. You know, if anything, cookie sales go up and crime goes down a little bit from what I've heard. So yeah, I know now there's a lot of uh, you know older couples that decide to have pot and pizza night. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Well, the thing is, is like, yeah, we keep wondering, is there, are they going to find something that's wrong with it? Well, the government has sponsored uh, study after study after study, trying to trying find to, something. Right. And have been wrong every time. They cannot find really anything. Um, I mean, as far as I know, there's this great book out there by Jack Herrera, which is a good strain too. Perfect but it was, strain for a chore day, let me was, tell you. You got to <laughs> clean your house. Get on that shit. So he wrote a book called uh, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And in there, it just goes over kind of the reasoning behind prohibition and, you know, from start to finish. Like, there's some really interesting stuff in there, especially about, like, uh, so hemp was the only thing that could stand up to the harsh sea weather in the old days of sea exploration. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't have any, like, you know, there was no other material you couldn't right. just make one like there's no do synthetic now. fibers or anything like none that. of that uh there was only one thing really you know hemp and could, it grew like a weed it literally does <laughs> yeah. on almost every environment in the plant on the planet right but without it there would be no uh sea exploration so think about that there'd be no what america america yeah uh, as we know it yeah. And, uh, you know, well, we'd be speaking Spanish, I'm sure it could, it could be. I mean, yeah, because they were they were kind of conquering around that time and everything. But they like, had to do seafaring they, travel as well. That's true. That's true. So, you know, there's just a lot. I'm kind of a history nerd. I Are like you? this stuff a lot. Yeah. I love it, dude. I, I If I say something stupid, correct me, please, because I love <laughs> like the History Channel. Honestly, before it jumped the shark and became like the ancient aliens channel i really yeah i really enjoyed the history channel and like just hearing about like you'll catch me sometimes just watching a documentary about a fucking rock in the desert and it's because it's like well there's historical significance to this rock that's what i like about it this rock here in (laughs) eugene organ is a very specific rock 
And we are here to talk about it today. <laughs> That's uh, a very good... Is that James Attenborough? <laughs> is that who it is? That's a pretty good. It's just one that I've developed over listening to them over time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's funny because you're right. No, they have a very specific cadence. Documentary presenters, especially nature documentaries and history documentaries, they can't just run away without you. They got to give you a chance to internalize those words and make sense of them before they just go, right? Oh, a lot like comedy. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing about, and I'll, I'll see, is, have you ever done any comedy in Texas when you've been down there? No, but I have plans to okay. because cousin lives in Dallas, so there's plenty of comedy clubs. I'm like, oh, and if I got a place to stay, that's the way to do it. So exactly. it works. <laughs> well, I asked, I asked Chris Castles about that. I'm like, what do you see in the difference between, you know, when you were doing comedy in Eugene and when you were doing comedy in Texas? He's like, oh, the Texas crowds are way dumber. And he, said, he was just, just flat out with that, just like kind of spit it out. And I was like... Do you mean that from like, are you being like ironic and saying like, because it's the state that it is? And he's like, no, honestly, like people are just generally a little more drunk, a little more dumb, a little more aloof. Sometimes you got to let it sink in a little more. And it's like, man, that, I mean, I'm not saying that I don't like the Eugene crowds, but that sounds like it might be more my type of crowd. <laughs> I might connect with them better because I'm dumber. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I couldn't know what you were saying more. I mean, I hate, I hate that, but it's true because one time another comedian said that I do great with a place at a place with hay on the ground. I think is how she said it. And I wanted to be mad, but I knew that. Yeah, you're right. You That's know, like I'll go to Texas because I, I can do my you know redneck material. Down there, I know it's going to fly. Yeah. You know, here and in Salem, people aren't sure about you. Right. You know. Yeah, you get too redneck <laughs> here. They start to think about uh, certain words to call you that might end your career, even if you didn't say one of those things. Let me just say <laughs> that that's kind of something I've found in comedy, too. Like, you can mess with people's perceptions of you, and that's going to change the way they take your what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So I know that I'm dealing, I'm, I'm working with like a defect here. I know that people are already making assumptions about me, but I think that's true with almost every comedian. It's just that we're also self-conscious that, you know, you have to process it a little more and in right. different ways. But me particularly, because I'm just like a tall white dude with a big red beard, like, <laughs> yeah, well, I was walking into a grocery store one day and a lady asked me, she's like, have you been in the woods? Is the fire's bad? Are they getting close? I'm like, no. It's kind of a random thing to ask somebody, <laughs> lady. Did, I mean, did you have like soot around your mouth or what was it? <laughs> no, I just look like I'm coming out of the woods all the time. So. Oh, man. That's funny. And she just asked you that. I wonder what people want to ask me. I've, I've, because I think about that. You know, one of my openers that I do on stage sometimes is about the way that I look. And one time I wore a collared shirt to tell jokes about me dressing the way that I do in my mind. And I realized it's like, I'm not dressed like that tonight. They're looking at me and they're not making sense of this shit, but I want to know so bad what goes through people's heads when they see me. Cause that lady kind of, she, she gave you a peek and behind the curtain, they think you look like you walked out of the woods for some reason, which I don't get. Well, there, there's also uh, some people are not very happy with, those who would identify as redneck. Oh, yeah. And that's I true. would say that that is totally founded. Because <laughs> I've know, been against it. Like, I've been up against them dudes. And it's like, yeah, you're, you are an asshole. It's like, no wonder, dude. It's like, I, I'll work a little harder to make sure people don't know I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of you. I'm, I'm with the crowd here. Yeah, it's all right. sure, sure. <laughs> I grew up very rural and in a, in a town where, and I call it a town because 2,000 people is all. And it, it, in the state of Oregon, but could not be less the state of Oregon that, that people from outside of Oregon see. You know, people see basically the I-5 corridor in, 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 is Oregon. You know, it's Portland, Salem, and Eugene. There's the beautiful coast, but they don't really associate that with anything other than scenery. And then on the other side of, the, uh, of, of Oregon's Rocky Mountains, the Cascades, that's where all those other people live, you know, <laughs> and, and I did grow up amongst those people. And I, I will say this. I've some of the rednecks that I know are the biggest assholes that I've ever met in my life and will honestly make you question if you knew that there were assholes that big in the world. 
also some of the rednecks that I know, all of their convictions aside, some of the nicest, most kind people that I've ever spoken to would give you the shirt off their back and an acre at their farm to to have a cow and grow some corn. Just get on your feet, you know, that type of thing. So I sometimes find myself ha- from just a selfish standpoint, like, man, I know rednecks that aren't assholes. But at the same time, one bad apple spoils the bunch. There's a lot of bad apples in that bunch. So I, I also know rednecks that are assholes. I try not to get uh, fed up with it. I, I, you know, you can only you can only fight so many other people's battles well, in your you life. Know, so as an apple, uh, I just choose to hang out with the oranges. <laughs> you know, it's uh... <laughs> and, and in Eugene, you can get dragon fruit and papaya oh. and all the exotic stuff, which is cool. So oh, yeah, any type of yeah. <laughs> Whatever you're looking for, you know? It's, uh, Just go down to the Whitaker and spin around. You'll see it down there. If you look there. hard enough, you might find that mung fruit. <laughs> <laughs> mung fruit. What the hell is that? Uh, I want to say that mung fruit is this fruit that it's very pungent. It is, like, extremely stanky. I might oh. be incorrect, but there is, like, this one particular fruit that people like to eat uh, from the region, region that it's named to. They just... It makes their eyes water and it smells horrible, but they just love to eat it. Like, good God, that's almost like us taking shots of like well liquor, isn't it? It's like just a pleasure thing that nobody can understand unless you're living it. Oh, <laughs> a pleasure thing. I'm not sure about. Uh, it's like here, drink this old crow, James. <laughs> Why is it for charity? They're, yes, yeah, oh, it's always okay. for charity. <laughs> old crow for charity. As yeah, let's have a, a sip of good beer and yeah. we'll smell of scotch after that. <laughs> oh, does it smell like old crow? No, it doesn't. It's no, wonderful. We're drinking good shit here. I, I, it's funny. We were just talking about this region. I have a buddy who that's his that's his drink, old crow and wild turkey. He drinks what he calls the dirty birds, and that's it. That's his whiskey. And I think it is more of a financial thing than anything, which I find to be the case when people are bird. Dirty bird drinkers. Um, okay, well, you you're only you only go dirty bird in desperation. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> if it's been a real bad day, you'd be looking at the the bar, and there'll be a bunch of bourbons, and you're like, oh yeah, today's a wild turkey day. Something's probably gone wrong. Yeah, <laughs> or you're just like, I don't have a place to sleep tonight. I need to get arrested. Wild turkey. <laughs> Because I've seen some, look, I've seen some parties go off the rails, and I feel like it was all Wild Turkey's fault. Like, all of it. Like, you three that did that shit were all passing that bottle around earlier. I know it's correlated. Well, remember, it's 50% fuck you up. Right. It's 50%. 10% more goodness, if you will. Yeah. Well, it's just, uh, yeah, you know, you got to pay attention to how much you're imbibing if it's 100 proof. Right. Yeah, I remember I, I got into some 100 proof brandy for a while. It's really good stuff, but you do have to remember that's 100 proof. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. wreck you if you're not careful. Before my wife and I got married and we were just dating, um, she went through a phase where she would just be like, Yeah, I just really like this Smirnoff Black. Cause she, you know, like all college girls, she's drinking vodka. Really like this Smirnoff Black. What, what is it about this Smirnoff Black that I like so much? And finally looked at the bottle, it's 100 proof. You like it because it's higher octane and you're getting where you want to be quicker. You don't have to drink as much of the, of the shit, you know? And and it's funny because she, I don't know if she ever noticed. I think she did. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's why she liked it. I could not drink the shit. Like, it's like it tasted like gas to me. And I, anytime you really get over 40, like, there's a couple things that I can do. I've, I've drank Everclear once or twice in my life. The people that seek out Everclear you're there's something wrong something got knocked loose during high school football practice i don't know there's no reason for that there's no reason for it no. i i did have a, a a roommate in the dorms he didn't live in my room with me but he was a couple doors down lost his sight drinking everclear one night because oh, yeah. yeah alcohol yeah. make you go blind and dude we had to carry him and he was uh, <laughs> if he wasn't not seeing he was doing a miraculous job of acting while running into the walls completely blitzed. Like, the guy couldn't see, and he would just walk de- headlong into a wall, and we had to take him back to the dorms and put him to bed, and all of us were like, is this our college story that we have to tell that this guy who has, like, lawyer potential 
went blind for good because we were just feeding him Everclear because that's what he wanted. Turns out everything's okay. He did see the next day, and he is a lawyer now, so that's, you know. <laughs> is all... that a good thing or not? <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, we... <laughs> I think you could expect it. I don't know if it's good or bad. I think expected is the way to look at it. But, dude, it was scary. And so it's like yeah. I you know, that shit can go wrong with 80-proof with stuff. You don't need 180-proof to get that out of your night. You, you know, know? It's, speaking of lawyers and 90-proof uh, or whatever, what is that, 190 proof? I think. I think it's 190 or 180. <laughs> yeah, it's up there. Yeah, I've heard that surgeons love cocaine. Uh, <laughs> I, well, you know, people in the Prohibition days and before, like especially during the Prohibition was a problem because you couldn't buy it. So people were trying to make alcohol out of wood. Right. And the alcohol that's produced when you make it from wood will make you go blind. Oh, it really? It'll it'll just knock your side out for good, like, every time? Yes, because oh, wow. it creates a certain type of alcohol. Uh-huh. Like, you know, that's why they use corn, I believe, is because corn produces yeah. the alcohol that is in scotch or, yeah, you know, right. whatever. But that was a big problem <laughs> uh, back in the day, you know. That's why, like, you know, I've come across some moonshine a couple of times, and people are like, yeah, you want to try some of this homemade alcohol? I'm like, yeah, you have some? And then I'll have some. <laughs> and then if you can see my hand and put it in it, then I'll drink it. Yeah, I'll give it a shot if you're not already blind. It's, uh... <laughs> what do you think about moonshine, the moonshine that you've had? Because I've had that a couple of times, too. And uh, one time, completely by accident, there was this bottle in my fridge, and I didn't know what it was. I was still in high school. And as a, as a high school kid will do, you just pop the top on an unlabeled bottle give it a sniff and throw some back because yeah, it's, it smelled like alcohol. I'm like, yeah, I'm a badass. No, my dad drove like out into the wilderness to these people that live off the grid. And this guy like slipped him this bottle and winked at him and didn't say anything. And I tried that shit and it made me not want to drink ever again for like three months. <laughs> so I, I think I may have only gotten a hold of some like actual moonshine, um, and of course, the reason they call it moonshine is because you can't be caught and it has to be brewed at night right. under the shine of the moon, uh, which is just a fun fact that I like to talk about. But I've only had it maybe one time and it it's just rough, yeah. you know, but it can, from what I understand, it can be better depending on who makes it. It can be sweeter, uh, but it will, it is very potent. Yeah. You very ever watch potent. that show Moonshiners? I've seen a little bit of it. Uh, it, it makes me forever scared because the guys that are the best at it still seem really dumb. Like, re- like I know they know their thing because they've been doing it for years and their gr- their okay. grandpappy did it. But these guys don't strike me as like from a chemistry standpoint or a not blow your own like digits off standpoint. They just don't seem that smart to me. No, did you see all of their hands? Probably missing a <laughs> finger, but th- th- not necessarily smart in that way, right? So. You have to be smart in a different way if you live out in the woods right. and there is nobody around. This is also why I think some guys get a bad reputation is because they maybe spend a lot of time alone and don't talk to people. So when they do, they start going off, like I'm in the truck or something. Yeah, you know? it's just your internal monologue, but there's other people there. Yeah, well, and a lot of times these guys are smarter than they put off. Yeah. And sometimes they're not. <laughs> Let's just mark that down. Sometimes they're not. But a lot of times these guys just found something that they could do that they enjoy doing and you know they don't really care about the consequences. Right. Like, oh yeah, it's illegal, big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um It's true. I know some people like that with uh like engines, cars and stuff like that, like mechanics. If you handed them a simple math problem, they might not be able to complete it, but they can take apart an engine and put it back together without one piece of paper telling them where to start, you know? It's like, did you just learn this or were you just that good at it? Like, you just popped out of the womb and you're like, hmm, that's a four-barrel car. It's going to cost you a little bit more gasoline, but get you a little more on the top end, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Some guys are just born that way. Yeah, they come Uh, out with a dip in their lip. (laughs) I think so. Their hands are already greasy yes. by the time they're out of the womb. Yes, they uh, come in, they come out with their adult teeth for some reason. I'm like, what are you, you ready to get a job, bro? You have overalls. Like, uh, 
that's but, just what the gown looks like. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just little overalls when he's in the incubator with the rest of the babies. Car hearts. Just the little ones, you know. Yeah, I, that one there, he's redneck stock. We got to treat them different, you know. <laughs> He'll bite you. Right. <laughs> and then three years later, you're at a local rodeo and out rides a kid on a sheep bucking like a bull. And you're like, that's that kid. Like, I knew it. He's two things. He's going to fix some engines and he's going to buck him bronco, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's something I have never really understood either. Like, I admire that uh, a lot of times these guys that will get on the on bulls or uh, bronx or whatever and just and ride for the thrill of it. Just, yeah. Yeah, all right, buddy. Pinch this bull's nuts, and I'm going to go. All right. And they're like, that's what they do, and they love it, and they got to be tough. Oh, real tough. And, uh, I mean, I'm not getting up there. Uh, No, thanks. I'm not even one for riding horses. I mean, I I love horses, but eh, I don't want to ride them, really. It's just not something I'm into. But I guess that's just uh, how some guys are. It's just like, all right, this might kill me, but. Let's do it. You yeah. Know, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, for some things, I'm okay with that. Like, I've been, you know, I, I, I've been parasailing. You know, I could have fallen out of that, I guess. Like, I, I, there's not much that I do that's that dangerous. I mean, literally the most dangerous thing I do ever is get on the belt line in a car. And that oh, yeah. right there is like, you're risking your bacon every single time you're driving on that fucking road. So that's probably my most risky thing. But I've known some of these guys that rode bulls and, and actually tried to compete and the thing about it is, is they start so young that by the time they're 30, they're just so fucking broken. Because what you don't see at the rodeo is them just getting flung around like a rag doll at practice. Like, don't forget, they don't just come out and do this. They have to go to their house, they have to tie their own bull's nuts, and then they have to trust it enough to get on when there's not an ambulance parked 50 feet away. And they get fucked up. I mean, I saw a horse one time. We, we go to this rodeo every single year. I go more for the beer drinking and the camaraderie, but I'm always <laughs> in my seat when it comes time to ride for the bull riding at the end because I'm fascinated by how big these animals are and why in the hell we chose eight seconds. Why couldn't we have chose five seconds? I've seen a lot more of them go for five seconds, and we could have a little bit more competitive of a, of a rodeo, but I saw a guy get stepped on right in his chest. One time, both back feet of this bull, and he fell underneath of it, and they stepped right in his chest, and he didn't move for like an hour. There's like ambulances and people, and there's like a horse will trot by every now and then, and and finally, it was like it was like the NFL, except for there was no TV timeouts, so it was like he could lay there as long as he wanted. And finally, he just got got up, gave the thumbs up to the crowd, and was like, "No, you were dead 15 minutes ago. Like we were, they were praying for you in the East Terrace. Like <laughs> you were dead." I don't get the I don't get it, but I will say this: for some reason, there's an appeal to me of drinking as much domestic light beer as I can in a sitting and watching that happen. I don't know why. Uh, maybe be, I think it's because a those guys are on the bull because it's what they love to do. Yeah, and it's entertaining for everybody else, you know. And that goes back to centuries old traditions of the Colosseum and the Roman games. Right. And those poor fuckers didn't get the choice. They're just like, ride that bull. No. Oh, well, I don't even know if they, (laughs) I don't know if they've gotten to the point where they were riding it, but there was like crazy stories of like a legion of Roman soldiers who fought like thousands of bears or something like that, you know, just like Jesus crazy stuff where they would have actual, they would, Fill, they would fill the Colosseum with water and have naval competitions yep. for real right there. Uh, you know, so it's it's part of us. They even had uh, colors. Like there was one where they were talking about chariot races, uh-huh. and th- there was an inscription that they had found, and the guy was like, curse the red team, and I hope they die, and maybe they not come back for the, you know, he was like the green team or something, you know, and that was thousands of years right, ago. Right, right, way back. So now, yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah, we were talking about that the other night when we had a beer, like that's kind of that barbaric feeling in a football stadium that you get. 
where it's like I, I, I what I said to you at the bar is like I don't I'm not a fighter I'm five nine I'm not that strong like I just am not the guy that needs to be in a fight but I'll fight a whole fucking football stadium of people dressed in a different color than me <laughs> at a football game you know and it's you're right it's it's in my blood going all the way back to the very roots of the family tree yeah well I mean if you think about how important the the games were to Rome and it was all a political thing uh you know and it they're, the Roman Empire throughout the time that it was a thing, well, the empire and before that when they were a republic, there's, there's a bunch of different phases of Rome. Oh, yeah. Uh, but the games and spectacles were always very important. I mean, and they, they still are today. And you think about what, they're, what they encompass. So Spain, France, England, I mean, all the way to Egypt in some cases. Uh, so, like, that's all of Western Europe, I mean, right? Germany, Poland, all of Western Europe. Uh, so we evolved later on to be what we are today. So those things that happened to our ancestors thousands of years ago kept on in oral traditions and and still in like a social atmosphere, right? So right. We deal the same things today, like fighting at, at soccer games. <laughs> Yeah. People just lose it. I mean, every and you you can read about it in in antiquity as well. They just people just start burning stuff down once in a while, you know. Right. <laughs> like, and you could take a number from the people on the soccer field because the you know one place I've never actually seen a, like a real true punch get thrown in like a high level professional match. I think is soccer because they fight the shit out of the stands. The people in the stands fight all the time. You step on somebody's toe out on the pitch and you get carded and you get sent away and you know, nobody ever gets real violent out there. It's like <laughs> you see violence all the time. Like a football game, if there's not a punch thrown, I'm like, well, this is kind of a boring game. You know, <laughs> hockey, they allow it. It's like it's in the rules. Like you can fight. Just don't fall down. We don't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I'm not sure that if that, guy. I heard that that was like an unwritten thing where it was like a, a pressure valve sort of deal where it's like, you know, these guys are going to play seven games against each other in the playoffs yep. and stuff. Yeah, we ought to let him go. Because, like, I mean, by game four, that guy just keeps sticking you. You're going to be mad at oh, him. Oh, yeah. And then game five rolls around, and you're like, one more time, and that motherfucker. And that's what happens. Yep. And hockey's <laughs> one of the few sports that's seen somebody that commit a an act in it that's actually been prosecuted. Did you know that? Yeah, there was a guy that got prosecuted for assault Real. because he skated up behind a dude and he cross-checked him with his stick across the back of the head and the dude fell head first and hit his head on the ice and he kind of rode him to the ground. And, I mean, it, if I'm not mistaken, it ended the dude's career or ended it for a couple of years that got hit because he had t terrible head trauma and they charged the dude. Um, I'm not sure if it was in Canada or if it was in the United States, but it was in the NHL. It was a, the, it was the player that got hit was on the uh, Anaheim ducks. And it was, I mean, but it was crazy because there was so much talk about, you know how the sports media will blow a story up if there's ever a reason for it. This one was all over ESPN for weeks and there was a lot of talk about, well, like, should they? I mean, if a baseball player decides to go and rush the mound, if he takes the bat out there, you're probably going to charge him, right? I mean, if he's if he's throwing hands and it's just, you know, it's Nolan Ryan and Barry Bonds and we're going to fight this out and then the benches are going to clear and everybody's going to get pulled apart, nobody's going to jail. But if Barry Bonds takes the bat out there and beats Nolan Ryan to a pulp with it, probably assault, right? <laughs> Maybe with a deadly weapon, yeah? <laughs> well, it, it could be... Uh, I I mean, I think intent is what what they're looking for. It's like, okay, obviously this guy didn't just check him. He checked him all the way to the ice. Yeah. You know, that's a little bit more. But, uh, you know, it's funny. We're bringing up, like, all these spectacles. Like, even in basketball, there's been fights that have broken out. And, like, each one of these seems to lead to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like eventually these big sporting events. Because, like, the immense amount of testosterone required to play sports, I mean, not necessarily do you need to play sports, but required to compete on an incredibly high level like that leaves some of these guys just jacked on it yep. all the time. Yep. And it's, like, unnaturally jacked, I think. Like, because you play sports, you need that. Yes. You know? No, you're right. Um, Neil Brennan has a great uh, director of the Chappelle show and stand-up comedian has a great bit about it 
where he's talking about back when Ray Rice hit his girlfriend, punched her in that elevator, and then drug her out, and there was the footage of that whole thing. And he's like, sometimes I think that people, they just, their job is violence. You've got, he said, what does he say about a football team? You've got uh, two guys that can catch the ball, two guys that can kick the ball, and then 28, like, murderers, basically. <laughs> and he's like, you you get caught up. just like, go to practice, do football, go to the game, do football, go out with your girlfriend, do football. Oh, son of a bitch, I wasn't supposed to do football there. You know, and, and I think that's what you're speaking to is like, your job is violence, especially on a football field. And you talk about the NBA. Did you see that uh, Malice in the Palace documentary? Uh, no. It's on Netflix right now, and it's part of a documentary series. They're, I can't remember what it's called right now, the series, but they're the same ones that did the Caitlyn Jenner one. Um, I think it's called, like, ah, I can't remember, but it, you remember the mouse in the palace with Ron Artest, and it was uh, in Detroit, and somebody, he was laying on the scorer's table, and somebody threw a drink at him, and he ran up into the stands, and it was like a full-on, like, two basketball teams and a full stadium of people all punching each other for like a good 15 minutes. <laughs> and um, they did a whole documentary about it. And it's like, there's people that are viewed differently because of that day. And like, they found the guy that threw the water and he got charged because he started the whole thing. And like, it's an amazing documentary, but when you break it down, you like sit here and talk to all the people. Like one of the guys that is one of the most um, involved Steven Jackson looks at the camera at one point in time and says, this is the last time I'll ever fucking talk about that night. So get that on tape. And it's like, and this has been 20 years ago and it's still that intense in his mind and it's still something that he, you got to watch it, man. Cause it's, it's one of the few that involved players fighting fans. And it's not <laughs> something that you see very often because most fans look like me, five, nine, a little bit doughy and not, in a spot where they belong anywhere near a court unless they've got popcorn and a beer. That's just how it is. Um, but in a, it's an amazing documentary. And it, I mean, I, there were some people that got absolutely wrecked that night. Jermaine O'Neal, uh, it was a his power forward for the Pacers. There's a guy just like kind of this chubby dude in Detroit gear walking up to him all fast. And they're on the court at this point. This is like towards the end of the brawl. And he squares up and hits this guy so hard mid-stride that the guy just does the splits. <laughs> and he just crumples. And the thing that you don't understand is if he connected a little bit better, that guy who was maybe like 35 probably would have died. Like that one punch could have killed him. No question. And so it's not as funny as what I make it out to be. But watch the documentary because the guy's fine. So it's <laughs> when you see that hit. <laughs> <laughs> something about it, man. It has staying power. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was watching that game because it was a play. I think it was, no, it wasn't a playoff game. They had just, the teams had just played in the playoffs. Detroit beat Indiana and won the title the year that Indiana thought Reggie Miller was going to go win the title. And so they played each other like the first month of the next season. And it's like what you're saying. It's that he was sticking me for that entire fucking playoff yeah, series. It's just like, yeah. oh, you can't take it. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, and then it comes to the fans. Like, you know, they probably deal with a lot of annoying fans in general. And then all of a sudden, what's that water? Uh, something completely harmless. <laughs> you know, it's over for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. And then what is it when one person starts, and then all of a sudden there's a bunch. Like, I remember going to, like, some sort of local cage fight, you know, and it's not long before people are out fighting out front. Yeah. Like, okay, it's just something that people do. They get amped up and start with the, I'm going to fight people. But it's like you said, man, uh, even one punch is enough. So from a six foot eight monster, you know, from somebody that doesn't, you can't comprehend the size of these men until you've stood next to them. And, and I just, as somebody that used to cover college sports, I stood next to a few Oregon duck football players that didn't even go pro and was just like, good God, you're a monster. Well, it's not necessarily the, the monster. Like, so I'm a taller guy. It gives me an advantage hand to hand, but I know for sure that even though Bruce Lee was nowhere near my size, his skill overcomes any advantage I have. Right. So it, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, if you have skill, that skill is more important than any advantage because you're never going to be able to beat skill. It's like, true. You, you know? It's true. So Which you, is why I carry this adage of you shouldn't be fighting because I don't. Never. you don't know who that person is. That person might have never thrown a punch. They may have thrown 10,000 of the same kind of punch. 
and learned it really, really well. And it's now what you could consider a knockout punch. <laughs> That's Bruce Lee, man. Exactly. 10,000. Uh, and it just comes down to the the last bit, which is like, you know, that's why uh, people who are nonviolent are often strange to us. It's like, you don't believe in that at all? Right. <laughs> what do you mean? And it just, I, I think it's because as humans, within the last 100 years, 150 years, we've gotten to this hyper um, peace movement. And it's the world is waiting to catch up with it. Mm -hmm. Like, our, uh, perceptions have changed. Um, as far as like, at least in America, but, uh, that doesn't change the fact that worldwide there are still armies and wars. And it's because it's only been 150 years of thousands of years of evolution of, uh, having to war. Yeah. War. <laughs> I mean, that's really all it is. It's like, you think about it, war. If you weren't at war few hundred years ago something was up like why are we not at war shouldn't we be conquering like shouldn't we be taking things from other people yeah so that they don't take our things you know because that was kind of the idea right it's like we can stay here and we can just be ourselves and everything's fine but sooner or later that dickhead over the wall over there is going to come over and try to take our shit so we better <laughs> just be proactive and launch a few rocks at him first right is i don't know I'm, I'm not a history buff like you is that true at all um well i most of the the wars have been fought over resources in some way. I mean, of course, uh, you, you know, and I, I'm trying not to like take that route because I've, I've listened to a ton of uh, hardcore history with Dan Carlin as well. It was an excellent podcast. Um, but it, he, he colorizes things in a certain way that most history can't. Uh -huh. That'll show us a little bit more of what it might've been like to live in those times. Actually, since we're on this piece, I've been thinking about it. What is it about ancient humans that are so like willing to throw down their lives, but more modern day humans seem to think that that's not like a thing? Because they used to line up in ancient times in squares <laughs> in the phalanx and just cut it up for a day. Yeah. And then. Do you think it has anything to do with life expectancy? I think it really could because uh, like, we're living twice like, as long now as they used to. Like I'm, I would have been in Roman times at the ripe old age of 36. Like I'm on the way out. They're thinking about putting me in a home if they haven't already in Rome, right? At 36. Well, I mean, it depends. Uh, uh, so a lot of times in Rome, you had to be a certain age before you could hold office. And I think what that means is, is you've survived enough of the military that you, you're actually smart. Right. Because everybody else just went down, you know, like if you weren't <laughs> smart and a good fighter, you you're done. Right. You know, but it could just be that uh, maybe life was so harsh anyway. Why not? Like yeah, you kind of have like, that nothing to lose mi mindset. Like, well, it can't be worse than Valhalla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like Valhalla is sounding pretty dope right now, actually. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> there's only 300 of us and there's a fucking million of them, you know, I. I don't know. I was trying to quote the movie 300. I don't think that's what he said, but. Oh, yes. The Lacedaemonians. <laughs> Thermopylae. <laughs> yeah, man, that's interesting. And, you know, I, I feel like it sort of changed because it's like now, you know, well, not now. We obviously haven't had a military draft in a long time. But, uh, you know, in the in the 60s during Vietnam and, and World War II and everything, they were taking people that I, w I don't want to say against their will, but kind of against their will. Like your number came up, you went bro. And if you didn't, you might go to jail or something like that. You know, they'll, they'll, oh, you certainly, would yeah, they'll jail. prosecute you. So, um, you know, unless your last name's Clinton, you didn't get away with it. Right. <laughs> Cause isn't, wasn't Clinton the draft dodger. Isn't that, it doesn't want, wasn't that one of their big criticisms back when he ran for president? He's a draft dodger. He moved to Canada from Arkansas to get away from the draft. I just remember that for some reason. Yeah, yeah, it didn't bother Donald Trump, but, uh, you know. I don't think uh, much bothered Donald Trump, to be fair. Nobody seems think... to care about that part either. I read a bunch. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, while we're talking about it, we'll get we'll get back to you. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like my dating life is like listening to a speech by Donald Trump. You know, when it's all said and done, it was mostly just a waste of everyone's time. But... <laughs> You know, I, when it when it comes to stuff like that, uh, it it has to be. It's a very serious thing, right? Because in this generation, 
I don't know that you want to draft us. Yeah, I don't think you so. Know? It's like, uh, they're, you mean I can't have my phone? Right, exactly. What, what do you mean? I got to cut my hair? It's like, Are we're you- trying to put you through <laughs> boot camp and you won't stop Naruto running. Will you please run like a normal human, you fucking dweeb? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to tie your wrists to your waist if you don't stop that. Uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> you'll hear, oh, yeah, daddy, do it. And then you're like, no, this is a punishment. <laughs> yeah, Just I don't go to know. the brig. I don't think the internet age does anything well the, from that physical standpoint in the military. But one thing I think they do do well is you give them all a drone and a controller and we rule the world at this point because if I mean look if any of these video games are any uh, any indication I know I've seen a picture of the remote control that they use for drones and it's modeled after the Xbox controller it's uh, it's literally yeah. and they're and they're like you know oh, just taking out digni- foreign dignitaries with them while I'm over here in war zone like where are we dropping <laughs> headshot bro <laughs> yeah. um I know it's it's ridiculous. Like the times that we really live in, and you think about like the technology that we walk around with in our pocket every day, far surpasses anything that we had like thirty years ago. Yeah, it really does. I mean, what uh, and like kids are just playing with them all day. Like, oh, games. We're stuff that if we would have touched that when we were kids, we would have got smacked because it was like a room, you know. Like, <laughs> right. You, and it couldn't have dust in it. If they had dust, it just the whole thing hit the ground, and we're oh, you know yeah. we're off the grid. Back in my day, son, we used to have to take the ball out of the mouse and clean it, <laughs> and put it back before we could use it. Your mouse had a ball in it. Mine has a laser. Like that's it. That's the point. It's like we can't. You couldn't understand that if you just said that to me. Is like, yeah, the mouse has a little ball, and that's how it moves around the screen. Well, we'll just put a laser in there. My head would have exploded in in junior high. I wouldn't have been able to comprehend that, you know? And it is funny, too. I think about all the time, and I know that this is a trope that a lot of people have have, uh, beat on, but I think it's very telling, and it's a a sign of the times, like you just said, that we live in. We grew up... How old are you? Do you mind? I'm 33. You're 33, so you're right in the same generation as me. I love to mess with comics when they ask me, though. I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. Guys, I don't give a shit. My age is one of the least most important things about me, and it's really the one thing that calls it out is if I take my hat off, you'll see that I'm balding. (laughs) But other than that, you know, we grew up in the age in school where we said, why do we have to learn how to do this? This graphing calculator has all the equations in it. And the teacher said, what? Well, you're not going to have a graphing calculator in your in your pocket when you grow up, are you? Yeah, dickhead I am. And not only that, I'm not going to need it because there's nowhere that we need to do algebraic equations unless you're doing math for a living. Like if you're an engineer, if you're a mathematician, you're a scientist, those things are really helpful. No trigonometry has entered my life since the last trigonometry class I took, okay? And and I can't tell you how happy I am about that because I was terrified that this was going to be a big part of life. That and, like, quicksand I was worried about back in the day. It turns out you don't even fucking run across either one of them. Yeah, you know, uh, so my big thing is I can't spell worth a damn. I have a terrible handwriting. I can't spell... Uh, and you know what? That doesn't even matter right. anymore. It doesn't matter. Just like, type it out. Text me, bro. <laughs> I can write cursive. It's to, <laughs> yeah, just illegible, but that's not important to me. I mean, <laughs> I know what I was getting at. I'm not <laughs> the one reading it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, see, I just need to see like a little bit to remember, you know? It's yeah. My, it's like my own language. Uh, people, like on my on the show that I do that uh, I'll have you on next week, yes. I hope. And I want, and we will do that next week. And I definitely want to talk about that. So it's a great segue. So keep going. Well, you know, it, it's just about, uh, I don't even know what I was talking about. What was I getting at? Uh, spelling in your handwriting. Spelling, yes. Mm-hmm. This comes up. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about weed earlier. We're covered. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, like sometimes the guests will try to read my cards because I write questions on them, you know, uh, interview style, like Letterman or something. Right. Uh, <laughs> and they're just like, I can't, can you even read that? <laughs> Like, yeah, I get it. I know what I wrote. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really not, uh, doesn't need to be spelled right. I mean. <laughs> and 
Hey, at but, least you knew nobody was going to cheat off you in school because they, they probably couldn't see what was going on over there. And they, you know. Yeah, that's a good thing, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I feel like I, I have, like, an ability to do a little writing, but... Uh, the other parts of writing just aren't so good for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the creative part I can handle. Oh, God damn. It gets so fucking hot up here. Um, I do want to talk about kicking it with James Manning because there's a picture right now. If you're watching this, you've seen a picture of James Manning in last uh, week's episode, Chris Green, and the words kicking it between them and probably <laughs> wondered exactly why that's been up on the uh, on the video the whole time. Tell us about kicking it with James Manning, which I'm going to be on next week. Yeah, so I uh, I started doing this project on Instagram because it was what I had the equipment to do, <laughs> and I I just started doing. I did about eleven episodes. I called it "Annoying My Neighbors, Annoying the World," right? <laughs> and I I took a break from that for like I'm going to say mental health reasons is what it was. And then when I came back, I was like, no, let's. Let's add some production value to this. I mean, let's have some production value. And uh, so I started doing uh, what I call kicking it. And it's just something I'm putting up on YouTube. Um, I'm actually looking into Anchor um, to start maybe putting it out in an audio version. Awesome. Um, because I heard it on your podcast, honestly. And I was like, oh, well, you know, we'll build it up one stone at a time. Yeah. Is really. But what I want to do is bring, especially comedians... But musicians, uh, artists, um, really anybody who has something they're doing, and I want to kind of promote that. So when I have comedians on, I I want to just have a good time, Let, and and let's see what we can pull forward. Let's see where my questions are going to take us, and uh, I just want it to kind of showcase the comedian and what they might be like on stage, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's really turned out to be super fun. Like, uh, I love the episode you, when you had Chris Green on. Chris Green is just such a funny dude, just dude. naturally funny. Uh, He's, you know. He made my head hurt. Like, the back of my neck was sore when we got done with that episode <laughs> because I had been laughing so intensely. And, and I mean, if you don't know who he is, you got to look him up on Kicking It, too, because your episode with him on Kicking It is amazing <laughs> as well. So He's just unapologetically always Chris Green, and that's what I love so much about him. Yeah, and I, I recently just put up the second episode, which is David Ledbetter, another I'm, Eugene comic. So and, funny, uh, too. He's he's great. Yeah. And I, I haven't watched the entire episode, but I've seen him a lot on stage, and he's just talented dude. Oh, yeah. He, he's got this truck joke. He, was, he calls it the redneck bat signal. And I'm like always, I'm like, come on, Dave. You going to tell the, the truck joke? Come on. Let's go. You know, I love it so much. But uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to seeing what strange <laughs> conversation goes on. Um, because I got questions for you, Marcus. I can't I wait. I can't wait. And I'm actually, to be honest with you, I'm kind of glad that we did this one first because this is so unscripted. Like, I know that you, I knew I wanted to talk to you about kicking it with James Manning, and I knew that I wanted to talk to you. But other than that, I didn't really, I used to prep a lot for him. Some of the authors and the smarter, like the people that deal with smarter things that are over my head, I have to prep for them. When I have a comedian coming in, I'm confident that you're good in conversation, especially because I had beers with you last week. But I'm confident that you're good in conversation, and I can't tell you how excited that makes me because I really just like to talk to people. I, I right. can't, I mean, if this podcast has proven nothing else about me, um, and trust me, it's proven more. You just need to listen closer. Uh, the flaws <laughs> are there. You'll find them. <laughs> but I really just like to have interesting conversation with people. And I, I say this a lot too. I get to talk to people that do cool shit and you're doing cool shit. You know, you're also a musician. We haven't even touched on that yet. Uh, the last time I actually saw you perform, you did stand up comedy and played music that same night, which, uh, from a nerve standpoint, that would have melted me into a puddle. So I'm glad that you can, you can actually handle that type of, uh, attention and, and, uh, pressure in a night. But, um, as far as, as your musical ventures, as far as your stand up goes, obviously we'll get into the shows that you have coming up, but, um, you're just kind of, kind of just out there honing your craft. Yeah. Working on your stand up, doing shows when you can. Yeah. You know, and I've kind of, I've really taken a step back. Like I, I just didn't want to really push stuff yet. Like, you know, things were going on, there's a spike, and none and none. And I just kind of haven't felt like I'm ready to go out and start 
pushing these shows. Um, because what I want to do is I really want to do a comedy showcase first and then play some songs afterwards and just keep people hanging out who want to hang out. And, uh, I mean, cause really when it comes to music, I'm a campfire guy. Yeah. I grew up around the campfire, uh, learning to play songs that my buddies would enjoy. And, uh, that's what I try to bring into the bar. It's a little harder when you do that because you have a stage and it, you know, the interaction is a little different, mm -hmm. but, um, but I noticed that in yeah. your song selection, every song that you played after the stand up show, I knew. And that's, I mean, I was like, unless well, you, you might've played some originals, I'm not sure, but I know the covers that you were playing. I was, I was like, yeah, obviously that's that one. You know, he's, didn't yeah. you play some CCR? No, no, it wasn't CCR. <laughs> Who was it that you played then? I knew somebody that you played. Oh yeah. Was... Well I do. Um, so I do my originals, um, but usually my originals and my dad's originals, um, James C. Manning Jr. Of course. Yeah. So like, uh, I usually do those one and three or one and four. And the reason is, is because you want people to be drawn in by this, the old stuff. Like I do old country music. So Merle yeah. Haggard and Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash, uh, you know, Hank Williams, Hank Williams. Everybody knows. I know a couple of Hank Williams tunes. I know a couple of, uh, one of Hank Williams juniors and one of Hank Williams third, uh, big fan of Hank's Hank, Hank three and ask Jack. I saw them at warp tour when I was like 14. Great oh, show, man. I had a chance to see him at well hall, but I couldn't make it that night. And I've been kicking myself ever since. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I love country music and, uh, especially, yeah. Hank Williams, the third is, is amazing. I like a lot of his stuff, but it, it just comes down to, uh, it's all the same to me. Like, music and comedy are different, but they require almost the same amount of time and effort. Mm -hmm. um, but they're both very fun. And they're just fun in different ways. And I, that's why, I, eventually, I'd like to start doing the combined shows. Sure. Uh, because before the shutdown and everything, I had five or six shows lined up that were like a mix of comedy and music. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to starting to book music shows again. I think in, in November is when I want to start. Um, but I just... It's hard, no, man. Okay. There's, yeah. no way to, there's no way to quantify how long it's going to be. And you don't... I mean, look, if you turn on the news, that only makes you less excited about when the eventual end is because it seems like well, it's further and further away every day. And the other thing is, is uh, yeah, you know, as a musician... Everything you do is exactly the same. So you practice, practice, practice. You get there. People can like it or not. Right. Uh, usually they do. And if they don't, they're probably not going to say so. With comedy, you can practice as much as you want. But when you get on stage, it is what it is. Right. Those and, people are going to handle it differently every time. <laughs> and you have to deal with, like you know, things that pop up, like maybe there's a, a dog in the audience all of a sudden, or a mouse runs across the stage, or who knows. Uh, so th that's what I love about comedy, too, is just that they're completely different performing aspects, but they're the exact same kind of art, almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just an entertainment thing. Right, you know? it's a performance thing, yep. Yeah. It's, you know, you wouldn't know this by looking around the room. You're sitting in front of a lag wagon poster and you're sitting to my left, your right of a Blink-182 poster. There's a Foo Fighters poster uh, on your other side. I'm a I'm a punk rocker and a, and a skate punk and pop punk and uh, ska and, you know, hardcore and metal is the stuff I listen to and I enjoy to play as well. But my dad uh, grew up with four brothers and... Their dad, my grandfather, was the only drummer in the family, and all the boys played guitar, and quite well for a couple of them. Like I have a couple very skilled uncles, and my dad who can can. In fact, that's my dad's Ibanez guitar sitting over there in the case. I don't know why he gave it to me because I suck at the guitar. <laughs> but I I decided to pick up the drums after my grandfather died and before I knew he was a drummer, and I didn't know. But they come to me like later on in life, and they're like, "Hey, we used to have." like a wedding band. Like we would play weddings all up and down the coast of Oregon. Um, you know, your mom played tambourine and your aunt sang and all the boys played guitar and, and grandpa played drums. And so they'll get together still in their seventies and late sixties. 
And like they'll all meet like once a year and invite a bunch of other musicians and they'll play all that stuff that you're talking about. They call it country and western. <laughs> and they've got a three ring binder of songs and it's all the people you just mentioned and more. They play a couple animals songs, they play a couple Beach Boys songs, they play Wipeout, you know, like little fun stuff, but they never invited me because during college and everything it was like, how many wristbands can I put on? I have three belt buckles. I'm so punk rock. You know, they never would have asked me. <laughs> and then once I finally grew up a little bit, they're like, do you want to maybe leave some of that kit at home and just bring a couple cymbals and a couple of drums and play with us? And I did it once and I fucking fell in love with it. I, I did the music. I had heard the songs before, but they weren't anything that you would ever find on my playlist. And then I sat down and I tapped along with them and we're not even playing them the way that they were written. We're playing them the way that everybody can, can play them and everybody can play along. And you know, um, it, they're, they're simplified a bit is how I'll put it. And even that, like it, it, it's just a, it's just a bass snare bass snare for me as a drummer. That's been playing for 20 plus years. But I just the the feeling that I got being in that group of people was very special. And so that music that you're talking about holds a very special place in this weird punk rocker's heart because I, I mean, that's the stuff that if I'd have listened to around my friends in high school and they'd have heard it, I'd have been chastised in public for because I thought you were the rock band guy. I thought you were the dude that knew all the new music. Like, no, I Johnny Cash is fucking good, you guys. Like, just listen to me. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, you had to keep that shit inside. But um, I really, I enjoy it, man. I there's, do. And there's been a lot of punk rock tributes to, uh, country music. Yeah, there I mean, has been. And, and I really think that it's not necessarily about what genre it's about. Uh, it's a storytelling art, you know? Uh, so a lot of country music these days turns people off. Like I tell people, oh, I'll play country music. You know, they're like, oh, I don't like no country. I'm like, you don't like Waylon and Johnny Cash. They're like, oh no, I like oh, that. You don't like Brad Church. You know, whatever. Yeah, it, it's just <laughs> yes. like because that it's formulaic. Yeah, I think these days, any the the radio country uh, just tends to be they know what makes money and they're going to go after it, and that's not what it's about. I think you know any real good music. It doesn't matter what genre you're in. It's got to have some soul. It's got to be you. It's right. got to be what you want it to be. And, uh, you know, people are always going to tell you, oh, you should do that, you should do this, or, you know what joke you should tell. <laughs> but uh, most of the time, no, nah, don't listen to that. Just do what you like because originality is what people like. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that, that's what I'm most drawn to uh, when it comes to maybe people I'm actually interested in, in in life or maybe just something new, but it's it's the fact that they're being original. And that's what's cool about comedy. That's what really got me was that you can't just do cover tunes. Yeah. You can't do other people's jokes. Yep. I mean, true. well, some people try, but you're not supposed to. That's good. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like this strange art form where it has some very specific rules that are unwritten. Yep. Like hockey. You yeah, know? exactly. Once the guy falls down, no more punching him. Okay. You know, and that's the same with comedy. It's like, all right, your jokes are supposed to be yours. And it's because they're so personal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's the person telling them is like, there's a lot of jokes that I, that I, I absolutely love that I could never breathe a word of on stage because <laughs> guess what? It ain't me. That's the, I think that's the big part of it. Yeah. And that's, that's why, you know, joke plagiarism is so frowned upon because you're not the same as anybody else out there, but you are similar to some people. And so when a similar person to you steals your joke and can actually pull it off, it's like, Hey man, fuck you. I wrote that, you know? And I don't think that happens among, you know, amateur comics very much. At least I don't hear it, but I've heard, I've heard a few amateur comics tell really well-known bits that I know that I'm sitting there in the audience, biting my lip and going, dude, you're telling a Robin Williams joke right now. Like pick, <laughs> pick below Robin Williams somewhere. <laughs> like You can't tell that guy's joke, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, come on. Yeah, dude. Right. Like everybody's seen Robin Williams, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I've also seen some that tell like maybe something I heard on Pandora that is a little less well known, but I hear it and I'm like, dude, that's word for word. I know. And I actually, it, it happened recently at a show when somebody had, that I know asked me like, Hey, how was the show? And I said, I thought it was great. There was just, there was one guy that told a joke that I, I happened to know belongs to like a touring club comedian. It's on Pandora. You can find it on Spotify. Like it's out there. And he was like, well, who was it? And I didn't know that the two guys knew each other. 
And I said, well, it was this this comic. And he's like, oh, I know that guy. I'll say something to him. And I was like, God, no. Not, you don't tell him I said that shit. I don't want him to fucking hate me over it, you know. But it. the thing was, though, is I, like if I was doing that, even if it was on accident, because I listened to a ton of stand-up comedy, I think I would want somebody to tell me. Like, dude, you're you're you might have accidentally done it. It might not have been purposeful, but you're telling somebody else's joke. Do you would you want to know if that happened to you accidentally or if you just kind of stumbled upon it? Oh, like I wrote a joke that somebody else has already done. Exactly. Yeah, I would want somebody to be like, yo, that's that's been done. I hope know? that that guy <laughs> felt that way because I don't I definitely don't want to mention him and I don't ever want to say who, where, what, why, when, any of that. But when I told, like, the mutual friend, he was like, oh, I'm telling him. I was like, God damn it. I, kind of, God damn it. I don't know that I want to be that guy. Like, well, I just don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Yeah, it was a good whatever. Bit. You know, it, it, comedy is so weird, man. It's so weird. And that's part of it is the fact that you have all these, like, old, maybe, like, cliches in your head. Or, like, there's one that comes out all the time. It's like, oh, I do comedy because I can't see a therapist, you know? Yep. Those kind of jokes are, like, vaudevillian. They're kind of public access. Public domain now, yeah. Public domain, you know, because there's not really a set writer to the joke. But when it comes to being a comic, and if you write a joke that works every time, I mean, those don't come along every joke. Right. Not everything that comes out of my mouth is worthy of saying again. And to get one that does work and have somebody else take it who's more famous than you, obviously you can't. You've got no... you got no recourse. Yeah. you got nothing. Right. You know? Yeah. It's it, Look, I mean, I don't claim to be talented enough to ever say anything that m- other people are going to want to steal. So I don't think <laughs> that part of it's going to happen to me. I think I'd probably be more susceptible to accidentally telling someone else's just because I got too high one night and was like, oh, that's really funny. I've never heard that before. Yeah, you have, <laughs> asshole. That's why you wrote it, you know? Yeah, well, it's kind of like I, I tell this joke so much. And it's weird. It's like as a comic, people will be like, oh, tell me a joke. And I've heard a lot of comics who are just like, oh, I hate that so much. No, I keep them lock. I keep them lock and loaded. Just like, all right, you, yeah, I got a couple for you. And it's like fishing. Why do they call it fishing? It's because hooking was taken. <laughs> and I've just heard so many people come back at me on that joke. Like one dude was like, I love that. I'm telling that at fishing camp. <laughs> telling it at fishing camp is exactly what I want. Yeah. You know? That's perfect. That's how it lives on. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And that it's just a one-liner. It's a nice, easy one that people can remember. Yeah. Uh, but if I heard that come from another comic on stage, I'd be like, you son of a bitch. He'd be like, if you, you see here on this Instagram <laughs> video taken September 14th, 2019, I have done that joke. That's my joke. (laughs) I would be all over it. And it's all of like, not even, what, five seconds worth of... (laughs) But it's your five seconds. That's my intellectual property, motherfucker. It's mine, you know? That would move me to tears if someone... If like I saw that on Netflix special. (laughs) No! Can I tell you the one that I keep locked and loaded in case any... Because people don't... I don't walk around like, I'm a comedian. People don't really ask me that. Nobody's really said in a long time. But it comes up in life. Tell me a joke, you know. And But I, I have one. And I do it almost sarcastically because of how much I hate when people ask that. Like, if you want to see me be funny, I'm up on stage. Come to a fucking show. I'm not <laughs> yeah. in your living room doing stand-up. But my, and, and please use it if you want to. Because I didn't write this <laughs> shit. And it's stupid. But somebody says, tell me a joke. I go, all right. Two muffins are in the oven. One muffin looks at the other muffin. He goes, God damn, it's hot in here. The other muffin goes, holy shit, a talking muffin. (laughs) Booyah. And that's it. And you know what? (laughs) It's stupid. And if you laughed at it, I appreciate the charity. But I know that people don't like that joke. And that's why I tell it is because I don't want you to ask me to tell a second one. Because guess what? There's not a second one. (laughs) You know what? There is a second one. Two cakes are in the oven. You know, it's, I don't. I, I'm not that interested in, in like the be funny on the spot thing. That's. I think part of that is because I love conversation so much, and I feel like there's a billion opportunities to be funny in any conversation if you're that guy. Yeah. And that's probably what I'm going to do because I seek approval. So don't make me parade up here <laughs> like I'm busking on the street. You know, okay, come so on. <laughs> don't take this the wrong way. Like I do the same thing, but the. What I do often, I've done this a whole bunch, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, <laughs> is I, I'll just start throwing off Mitch Hedberg jokes. 
Oh, you know, okay. I tell people like these are Mitch Hedberg jokes, but here you go, little one liners that yeah. are easy to remember and yeah. hilarious. Yeah, and and he was like the a legend among comedians for doing the one liners, and uh, you know. If I want some honey, I don't have to squeeze a plastic frog. You know, it's like, <laughs> but the thing that people don't get about stand-up is that when you're on stage and you're crafting the joke, you're doing more than that. You're also crafting the audience. Like, you, like for me, I need to overcome that perception of, is this guy asshole redneck or is this guy cool redneck? Right. Like, yeah, you know, there's one more in uh, one category and less in the other, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, that's what we have to deal with. Yeah. And when you're on stage, you can work that. You have a little time, you can move things around, and you can become funny depending on what you think is going to work and what gets laughs and what doesn't. But when you're telling a joke to a random person or just someone you're standing next to you, it's just not the same. Right. You don't have that same criteria. Anything you come up with is fine at that point. Right. Because there's no yay or nay. It's like, oh, this is my joke or it's not my joke. <laughs> it's, it's almost like we should take the power away from them as comedians and say, listen, if I was up on stage about to tell this joke, I would have gotten to feel the audience out first. So I'm going to need you to fill out this questionnaire <laughs> and uh, I'm going to get a little touchy. Okay. We're just going to feel the audience here and make sure that everything is where I want it. Yeah. Then I'll tell a joke. Or a little more like, okay, well, uh, you know, let's talk for 10 minutes. Right. I think in 10 minutes, I'll be able to find something that I can remember is funny. Exactly. <laughs> yes. In conversation, I'm great. Just put me on in conversation and you might laugh. If I'm trying too hard, you can tell me that too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, man. So uh, before we go away from comedy, because we're talking so much about it right now, you have a couple shows coming up in October um, up north. You're going up to Washington to do some stand up. Yeah. Um, so I got invited to be a part of a couple of showcases up in, uh, so Seattle at the Jewel Box Theater on the 22nd there. It's, uh, in association with, uh, association with Eugene Comedy Crescendo. Mm -hmm. Uh, James Blame, uh, invited me to come and do this showcase and, uh, I believe Tim Curry is the headliner that night. Oh, wow. And, but I mean, we got, uh, Tyler Jones is going to be on there. Another Eugene comedian, um, it's really uh, kind of the biggest show that I've been a part of, uh, so I'm pretty stoked about it. And then we get to do another show in Puyallup uh, the next day, um, and also another big list of comedians on that one. And I'm just super happy to be a part of it yeah. because being able to get stage time in a different place is uh, it, it really helps me on my goals to maybe becoming a full-time comedian someday. Right, you yeah. Know? And developing those connections and, and being, you know, next time you go up there, it'll be twice as easy as it is this time to stand on stage in a different city, right? Because, I, yeah. I mean, honestly, that's how I feel. It's like every time you're in a new spot, you jumped over a hurdle. All right, I can do stand-up in Harrisburg, Oregon now. I've done it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I was in Kaiser and <laughs> didn't really go over, but uh, I did it. It was, I did my best to win them over, and I learned from that. Uh, that's <laughs> So, yeah, I'm hoping that I don't horribly bomb on those shows, but uh, I, I've been working hard on the material, and, uh, you know, there's more um, open mics coming up to give me a mm -hmm. chance to uh, try stuff out. Like I believe, what is it? Thursday. I think tonight we got the, uh, fight mic at the Drake there in Eugene. And so, now I know that's called the fight mic. Is there actually like, do, do you do like battle stand up or is it like a roast or anything? Or is it just normal open mic? Yeah. So it's like, uh, it, it's a normal open mic, but you're invited to roast the hosts and the hosts will write roast you. Oh, okay. So you, you can roast that's back. That's great. I love and, that. Yeah. It's fun. Um, and it's just another opportunity to get out and do comedy. And that's what that's what comedians need is more stage time. So, uh, yeah, I, I pretty much show up wherever I can. Anywhere sure. they'll let me. You know, I've been trying to look for those places with hay on the ground. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so. well, that's awesome well uh check out eugene comedy crescendo on facebook also check out james on facebook um instagram i know is where a big deal is uh you james got a lot manning the third james manning the third and then your youtube is james, also 
James Manning the third. James Manning the third. So I will yeah. link all that stuff in the description of the show. So if you're uh, listening to this and you want to know directly where you can watch episodes of Kicking It with James Manning or see any of the hundreds of things that you've put up on Instagram, I'm sure. I don't know about. It. Oh yeah, well pictures. Sure. Yeah. I did one that was recent. That was real good. That went over real well, and it was pictures of me uh, showing my clean bathroom. Oh, and my sink that was not full of dishes. Nice. Uh, Really went over well. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's like, I was like, I think that we'd do better as men if we sent pictures like this instead of dick pics. So, yeah, go go check the pictures. It's really been working wonders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you can insinuate then without being too on the nose. Like, hey, if my kitchen counter's this clean, imagine what other things in my <laughs> person are clean. You Just... <laughs> I'm, you know, we don't have to go too far. Uh, <laughs> don't deconstruct I didn't, it. I didn't take pictures of my bedroom. Uh, it just, it's not very impressive, is the thing. It's, it's not as... It may be as clean as my toilet, but it's not as sparkly white, you know? I don't know. Not as much porcelain in your bedroom, I would hope. <sighs> you know, I've, been, I've had that on order for a minute. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Dude, James, I, so I asked everybody this. How long do you think we've been going? Oh, geez, I don't know. Uh, you want to take a stab? I'm in, uh, I have no idea. I would say f- 45. Really? See, we uh, it's almost an hour and a half right now. We're an hour and 25 <laughs> minutes. No, it's, I ask people because I want the conversation to feel like you haven't been here for an hour and 25 minutes, you know, and that's the most important thing for me. But, dude, thank you so much for coming in and joining me. I can't wait to do Kicking It with James Manning. That will be out uh, within a couple weeks, maybe three weeks or something like that. I'm not sure what your lead time is on those, but we're going to record that next week. Yeah, yeah. So h- hopefully it'll be out next week as well. Awesome. Um, I do some work with uh, a guy who does my editing. Um, so, you know, I'm really hoping that we can get that done. But uh, Senate is uh, awesome. And he pretty much, I've been able to just turn stuff over to him. And he just kind of makes it happen. He does a great job. He's, he he's does a great job. Man. He knows exactly what it is. And we're starting to get this thing to, down where I can be. I'll do. I'll say something and then wait. <laughs> like, because I know something's coming. Just but, to uh, give him a chance to put in the fancy edit and do something fun. And, yeah. Well, it, and it's all about having a good time. And that's the thing. It seems like uh, the Man Room podcast is about is just, hey, hey, you know, show up, have a good time. Have a drink with me. Don't be an asshole. Everybody's welcome. Um, you can even play the drums afterwards if you really want to, people. I just, yeah. you know, I got some I got some criticism this week from somebody that I know actually quite well that told me, I'll never listen to another podcast with two people that I don't know. It's like, well, wait a second. Okay. You don't really know me. I'm not famous. Why do you think I'm going to be able to pull in a bunch of fucking celebrities into this show, you know? And I really, like, when I, when I heard that, I, well, I read it via text message. And I, I always want, when somebody criticizes me and I don't agree with it, I always want to, A, defend it, explain my reasoning, and then tell them why they're wrong about that after I've explained why my mindset is what it is. I That one I didn't even entertain. Like, I get to talk to so many fucking cool people in this room, and it has really been a lot of fun, dude. And you're just the next one on the list, and we're going to do it again because everybody that I've had in here has just the pure and simple fact that you're here means you're invited back. Okay. So anytime you got something that you want to promote, anytime that you have something new coming out or a show that you want to get a little extra traction behind, let's talk about it and let's just come up and have a drink and have a good time, dude. And I really appreciate you. You've been a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, I think it will be a good episode next week. So, uh, but this is just another, uh, bit of the fallout from what's happening in Eugene right now. We yeah. just, we have so many people that are super talented, fun folks to be around. Um, so yeah, glad to be here, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. And to the person that criticized me, move to fucking Eugene and you'll know all these people, dickhead. <laughs> yeah. I'm never right. going to watch another movie <laughs> with two people. I don't know in right. it again. Yeah. It's like, good <laughs> luck naming all the cast of Avengers, you prick. Yeah. Oh, oh man. So you I'm know, and little... I just want to say thank you for having me here today. It's a special day. It's uh, national. Don't be a dick day. Did you know that? I didn't No. But... Yeah. Every day. Oh, yeah, I got okay, it. Yeah. All right. See, Boom. Tell me a joke. That's why you have this guy at your parties. <laughs> James Manning the third. everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening.